I just want to take a minute to let you know, if you like This Is Monsters, you might like my other show, Somewhere Sinister. Each season, we go to a different place and tell sinister stories from that area. You can check it out by going to this link here. Thanks so much, and on to the story. The Jaeger family set out for a month-long summer road trip on June 16th of 1973. Their first stop was Chicago, then they stopped at a few places in Colorado and Wyoming. The bulk of the trip, though, was going to see various scenic spots in Montana because they were scouting out a place they might want to move to. The father of the family, Bill, had been to Montana before and was quite fond of the state. The trip was a breath of fresh air for Bill and his wife Marietta as they hadn't taken such an extensive road trip together since they started their family. They had five children, all ranging from age 16 to their youngest, Susie, who was just seven years old, and they'd finally decided she was old enough to go on a big summer road trip. They were just over a week into their trip when they arrived at the Missouri State Headwaters Park in Montana. The park marks the spot where the Missouri River starts, and the Jaegers were excited to explore the expansive wilderness around the river. They spent a few days camping and taking in the sights, and Marietta's parents drove up from Arizona to spend time with them. On Sunday the 24th, the children went to bed bundled up because of the chill in the air. Susie's eldest brother and grandparents slept in the camper van, while Marietta and William had a shell in the back of their grandparents' truck. This left the four youngest children all together in another tent where they were free to chat late into the night. Susie and her sister Heidi woke up at around 2 a.m. and talked for a bit before going back to bed. Evidently restless, Heidi also woke up around 4.30 a.m. and noticed something disturbing. She saw a light coming through the edge of the tent where Susie had been sleeping. On the edge of wakefulness, Heidi thought that the tent had fallen down and she was looking out the window that had fallen to the ground. But when she moved in for a closer look, she found Susie's sleeping bag empty and that the morning light was coming through a hole in the tent. Susie was gone. While Heidi and her brothers Frank and Joey all slept, someone had carved into the tent with a knife and taken Susie so silently that none of them had woken up. The hope that Susie had somehow gotten a hold of something to cut the tent open and left voluntarily was unlikely. She had a stuffed dog and a teddy bear that she would never go anywhere without, and both animals had been discarded just outside the tent. She'd apparently taken them with her, and whatever silent struggle happened before they were tossed aside. Within minutes, the whole family was up and looking. Neighboring campers quickly joined in, and Bill took off in the truck to drive to the nearby city of Three Forks where he could find a phone to call the police. Deputy Don Houghton was first on the scene, and he quickly called for backup to get more boots on the ground. A seven-year-old girl was missing, and the hunt was on to find her. This is Monsters. Because Susie was a child and the slash in the tent made kidnapping likely, the FBI was called in that morning. They sent over Special Agent Byron Dunbar, who went by Pete. Dunbar had considerable experience working a variety of cases all over the country, but had asked to be stationed back in Montana a few years before to help care for his parents. His family had actually owned the land that was donated in the 60s to become Missouri Headwater State Park. He brought with him both worldly experience in high-profile crimes and kidnappings, as well as local knowledge of the area, the people, and the land. The campers nearby who'd helped with the search were brought in for questioning, as they were close by when Susie was taken. Then, as the search intensified, locals were allowed back in to help as volunteers. During those first few days of the search, police brought in dogs and small aircraft. They searched by boat along the Missouri River and rode on horseback through the woods. Teams with citizen volunteers trekked on the hiking trails while authorities trudged through more untamed parts of the woods. The search went through abandoned cabins and homesteads, and farmers anywhere nearby were encouraged to scour their land. Within the first few days, the most notable finding was the remains of a campfire that sat on a cliff overlooking the campground where the Jaeger family had stayed. 
There had been a drought in the area for about three weeks, so authorities couldn't tell how recent the fire had been made. But they could see the Jaeger family campsite from the cliff with binoculars. By then, both authorities and the media were considering the idea that whoever had taken Susie might have prior experience in violent crime. The first case that the media immediately wanted to connect to Susie was a strange incident that occurred in 1968, five years prior, in the very same park. A group of Boy Scouts had been camping in the park, strangely enough in the exact same spot the Jaegers had set up their campsite. The trip had been uneventful until the morning of May 5th, when a scout named Ken Summers woke up to find his tentmate, 12-year-old Michael Rainey, covered in blood next to him. The tent had been slit open and someone had stabbed Michael near the armpit. Michael was unresponsive but alive and was rushed to the hospital. Though the stabbing had punctured his lung, it was not serious enough to have been life-threatening, but Michael died anyway two days later. An autopsy would eventually reveal that the real cause of death was trauma to the head. However, the lack of any visible bruises or abrasions on Michael pointed to the fatal blow having been struck while Michael was being smothered with some kind of pad or pillow. The killer had been so silent that Ken did not wake up at all while the boy next to him was being murdered. Though one scoutmaster later said he heard someone yelling for help that night. When the scoutmaster went to investigate, he saw nothing. The sounds appeared to be coming from a different tent, and regardless, Ken Summers likely would have heard if Michael Rainey had been screaming next to him. Police questioned all of the Boy Scouts who were camping that night and many nearby campers, but the case went cold. That first week, the Jaegers stayed in their camp, hoping for news and wanting to be nearby if anything was found. But they all slept together in the camper now. Locals helping with the search offered support. They brought them food and notes with good wishes. Toys were sent in for the Jaeger children, and William and Marietta brought them on various activities to help distract them while they waited. Heidi went horseback riding, a local vet took the kids to watch sheep getting herded, and the younger boys went to a rodeo. This provided a small glimpse of fun to distract the children from the constant wait for news on Susie's disappearance. While law enforcement combed the woods and searched waterways, the FBI took on the brunt of interviewing and canvassing. They brought in a polygraph expert right away, and the FBI sent a half dozen agents to accompany Dunbar. The agents worked 16-hour days, canvassing the neighborhood and helping in the search. Local law enforcement worked overtime, too. Houghton, who'd been the first on the scene, didn't sleep those first few days. Desperate to find something, the Detroit News in the Jaegers' home state posted a $3,000 reward for information, which when adjusted for inflation would total over $20,000 today. Tips and phone calls were pouring in and most of them were dead ends, the notable exception being a strange phone call someone made to the Jaegers on June 28th. The family kept the details of the call secret for a week until they needed the media's help. Someone had called and asked for a ransom, and in describing Susie, he'd mentioned a unique birth defect she had that Marietta had forgotten to mention to the authorities when they circulated her description. The family was trying to cooperate with the caller's demands, but they needed the media to advertise that they needed the caller to contact them again. Marietta told the Bozeman Daily Chronicle that they were hoping that Susie was alive, but they were considering the possibility that she wasn't. After a month, the Jaegers decided they should pack up and head home. The Billings Gazette spoke with William about if his daughter's disappearance had changed his idea that he might want to live in Montana someday, and he said it had not. If anything, the locals banding together to bring them food and take their kids around to the local ranches had endeared the state to him even more despite the tragedy. Leads kept pouring in but went nowhere and the FBI did not contact the Jaegers about most of the tips that came in as they didn't want to get their hopes up. Most of the tips were psychics describing their dreams or scammers trying to cash in on the reward money. Back in Michigan, the family kept Susie's belongings where she'd left them, but all things considered, they reported that the other children were coping very well as summer ended. They still fielded phone calls, but less often than they had, and nearly all of them led nowhere. Though one call on September 24th that was taken by Susie's brother Danny stood out. 
The caller told Danny the same detail he'd mentioned before about Susie, and taunted him a bit, saying maybe they would get Susie back after all before hanging up. Law enforcement had gotten a call in July that was likely from the same man, so it appeared that they might be hearing from him again if he'd already contacted them a few times. By the year's end, the family had nothing new to report. Susie's name would show up in the papers on occasion. Two girls were kidnapped in another part of the state, and a little girl from Missoula was murdered, and each time authorities made a statement that the crime was not necessarily related. This didn't stop the public from staying on high alert, and the citizens of the cities near Missouri Headwater State Park were all on edge. Though people were eager to connect any murder or kidnapping in Montana to what was happening, it was February before there was another missing persons case nearby. On February 9th, a woman named Sandy Dykeman Smalligan vanished from the nearby city of Manhattan. Manhattan was the second closest city to the park after Three Forks. Sandy's parents called the police, but they weren't too worried the first day. They thought Sandy was just hanging out with her boyfriend or perhaps another friend, but when the second day rolled around, authorities started to worry about foul play, and the media started printing Sandy's picture. Sandy's apartment was a small space above the local implement store and held no clues to suggest foul play. They found no blood and no sign of a struggle, but Sandy's car was missing. As the week wore on, police diverted some of their resources that were still focused on Susie to finding Sandy. Police brought in riders on horseback, off-road vehicles, and a formidable search party of around 100 searchers made up of law enforcement, local hunters, and other volunteers, many of whom no doubt had just tracked the same wilderness to look for Susie Yeager that summer. Don Houghton, who'd been first on the scene at Susie's abduction, had already spent countless hours looking for her, and once again set off into the wilderness on February 17th. He was paired up with Marshal Ron Skinner to participate in a search of old farmsteads. Skinner was familiar with the area and knew where to find many of the area's old wells, barns, and abandoned houses. The search of the old Lockhart family homestead started out like any other. The men went through the decaying house, disused since the family had all either passed away or moved on. The yard held a burn barrel that looked like it had been used to burn trash. There were small signs of recent human activity. The barrel looked to have been used recently, and some of the chairs in the house lacked the distinctive patina of dust that the rest of the household had, but it wasn't uncommon for travelers to venture into these old homesteads. When the men got to the barn, they found the main entrance unlocked and took a peek around. They didn't see anything concerning, but there was part of the barn that had been sectioned off for storage. The outside entrance to get in had been nailed shut, but the men were able to take a look into the room through an access flap, and it looked to be just full of old boxes and barrels. The men were getting ready to leave when they spotted something in the grass on the way back to the car. It was a pair of women's underwear that looked to have been very recently discarded. The men both agreed they needed to take a closer look at the barn. Houghton kicked down the access panel and crawled inside. There he found a large tarp that had been covered in hay hidden amongst the boxes. When he pulled the tarp up, he found a white Ford Cortina. The plates were gone, but the make and model matched Sandy's car. There was no signal to radio back, so Houghton drove up the nearest hill, and Skinner was left to wait and stand vigil at what was quickly starting to look like a murder scene. Backup arrived over an hour later at the remote farm. By then, darkness was falling, but they had time to confirm that there was not a body in the vehicle. The next day, officers processed the scene and found Sandy's purse and numerous other belongings in the car. Searchers combed the nearby woods, hoping to find Sandy herself if by some miracle she was alive, or at the very least to recover her body. Sandy's family was able to identify the underwear as being hers, and police quickly found her license plates hidden nearby in the shed. But that wasn't all they found. There was a knotted up rope, a bloody leather whip, and a handsaw. A suitcase in Sandy's car held the clothes she'd been wearing on the night of her disappearance. A closer inspection of the burn barrel revealed something rather disturbing. 
half buried in the dirt were blobs of something that appeared charred and bloody that would later be identified as partially melted fat and intestines. There were small shards of burnt bones scattered in close concentration to the fire ring and strewn about the property. The bones were so smashed up that police couldn't say for sure if they were human or animal, or even how many different skeletons the bones might have come from. By the 26th, authorities were able to determine that the bones belonged to two skeletons, but were only able to identify one as human. There were over 1,200 charred and smashed fragments collected for analysis. The FBI was assisting fully in the investigation, hoping to help if there was any possibility Sandy was alive and they were dealing with a kidnapping, and also ready to help process the scene as the bones hinted at multiple victims. The story was all over the news. Everyone in nearby Manhattan was ready to help. Sandy had been a sweet girl and was well-liked, and though the bones were still being processed, many were assuming it was her. The Bozeman Daily Chronicle interviewed one anonymous man who had put up a noose in the window of his shop. He said it was a sign that the people wanted justice and that, quote, if we catch the guilty party, we'll save the county the expense of getting rid of him. Numerous citizens showed up at the crime scene to try and offer their help with the search, as police were still recovering bone fragments. One man, David Meerhofer, brought officers a red woman's blouse that he said he found in the woods nearby. The police thanked him and quickly shooed him away, as David was known for hanging around the local police and trying to help out with cases. Police would normally humor David and let him speculate when he wanted to chat with them at the bar, but they didn't have time for him that day. Unbeknownst to him, David Meerhofer was getting the attention of the police in more ways than one. That same week, David's father, Clifford Meerhofer, made a trip up to Special Agent Pete Dunbar's office. He told Dunbar that he didn't have any evidence, but that he was worried that his son might have had something to do with Sandy's disappearance. David and Sandy had briefly dated, and David lived in the same apartment building as her, which was actually owned by Clifford. At the time, David's father asked to remain anonymous and said he only had a hunch, but he wanted Dunbar to prove his hunch wrong. On March 3rd, the media announced that police had reconstructed a jawbone from the bone fragments and that some of the remains did belong to Sandy. The next day, the town held a funeral for Sandy and over 500 people showed up. One strange detail that was not disclosed to the public until later was that the police found bone fragments from almost every part of Sandy's skeleton except for her hands and her pelvis. While analysis of the other bones was still ongoing, a miscommunication with the media said that the lab at the Smithsonian that had tested the bones had ruled out that they belonged to Susie Yeager, and speculation slowed on the connections to other cases in the media. Really though, behind closed doors, speculation was ramping up. The findings had actually shown that the other skeleton was human and belonged to a girl around Susie's age who had been killed sometime within the past year. There were also numerous animal bones found at the ranch. Throughout the course of the investigation, police would look at over 1,500 people in connection with the death of Sandy and the disappearance of Susie. Shortly after Sandy's bones were identified, though, they had seven men they were focusing on. Bob Harrison, Sandy's boyfriend, was a prime suspect. He failed his polygraph, refused to submit to a truth serum test, and was belligerent with law enforcement. Nearby sex offenders were all questioned and cleared except for two. One was a pedophile who was out on parole and had a house full of hundreds of naked dolls. Creepy. The other was a man who had committed numerous rapes and tried to kill his family but had been stopped before he could burn his house down with them in it. He was also out on parole. These two men were scheduled to sit down for a polygraph test. Though they'd conducted polygraph tests already, Dunbar wanted to bring in a more experienced polygrapher from the FBI now that the suspect pool was narrowing. Dunbar also decided to ask David Meerhofer to take the polygraph. David had been questioned in Susie's kidnapping and needed to be lumped in as a suspect in Sandy's murder because he dated her. More than anything, though, Dunbar just wanted to eliminate David because he didn't think there was any way David was guilty. Dunbar had dated David's mother, Eleanor, in high school and knew him tangentially, and he respected David for his military service. 
On top of that, David kept going out of his way to speak with law enforcement and ask how the case was going, and provide them with leads. Of course, this would be considered suspicious behavior today, as some killers will try to inject themselves into an investigation. But in the 70s, investigators weren't really aware of that fact yet. Dunbar went for an informal questioning first. David gladly brought Dunbar and a few agents into his workshop and let them look around. David did handyman work and owned a few properties, and sometimes worked as a ranch hand. He enjoyed being self-employed and was well-liked around town for the most part, though a few of his fellow citizens had thrown him under the bus as being a suspect because they found him to be a bit odd for reasons they couldn't explain. Dunbar found David easy to talk to, but when he brought up Susie Yeager, David bristled. He was offended that law enforcement kept bringing her kidnapping up to him instead of finding the man who did it. David was a bit hesitant when Dunbar brought up the polygraph, but agreed when Dunbar insisted it was a concrete way to clear his name and get law enforcement to stop bothering him. Both the sex offenders and David passed the polygraph. The first two were nervous, and one was hiding something but not concerning Sandy or Susie. David made only one confession, and that was that he was wearing socks he had stolen during his time in the Marines. After that, Dunbar found himself at a dead end. The next month, Dunbar was down at the FBI base in Quantico, Virginia. He'd visited to attend a seminar about criminal psychology led by agents Patrick Mullaney and Howard Tetton. Mullaney and Tetton led the Behavioral Science Unit, a division formed just two years prior that was trying to explore new ways to combat violent crime. They were especially interested in the nascent science of criminal profiling. Dunbar felt that Mulaney and Tetton could provide some new insight into the case that had stumped him and asked them to weigh in informally. When Dunbar went back to Montana, he sent them copies of everything and they became invested. The fact that the killer targeted both adults and children and put careful consideration into concealing his crimes interested them. They hoped that the case might give them some new information about profiling as the victims did not fit a usual pattern, and they also thought that the case could be a good testing ground for some of their theories. Dunbar was stumped, and at the very least, they could give him more eyes on the case. While Dunbar followed up on psychics and sightings that went nowhere, Mulaney and Tetton were putting together the basic patterns they knew from similar offenders. The killer would be a white male in his late 20s or early 30s, simply because most killers of this type were. The term serial killer had not yet been coined, but a younger agent who assisted Mulaney and Tetton on the case, Robert Ressler, would coin the term that same year. Beyond the basics, Mulaney and Tetton surmised that the killer would have sparingly been able to hold down a long-term relationship with women and that the level of planning and stealth he exhibited pointed to intelligence and military experience. They thought he would be someone well-known in the area, but someone who worked a solitary job. He would be someone that tried and failed to completely hide his oddities, and those around him might find him to be a bit strange. As Mulaney and Tetton were able to ask Dunbar more questions, they began to put together more obscure traits they believed this unknown subject or unsub possessed. Based largely on Ed Kemper, they assumed other multiple murderers likely had issues stemming from a bad relationship with a parent. They thought this killer would likely enjoy keeping bits of his victims as trophies, and they predicted that when they found him, they would find the bits of victims that hadn't turned up. They predicted he would be someone that wanted to insert himself into the investigation and would likely be friendly with local police. They also predicted that he was not yet done with the Jaggers and would call or write again to taunt them, perhaps on the anniversary of when he stole Susie. Dunbar encouraged a local reporter, Hugh Van Swearingen, to call the Jaeger family and get an article ready to print on the anniversary of Susie's abduction. He wanted to play into Mulaney and Tetton's hunch and figured that having an article in the paper might encourage the killer to call that day. The anniversary article covered all the bases and ran a few days ahead of time to give papers time to print the story the day of. In the interview, Marietta spoke intensively about the first ransom call and how she wished the kidnapper would call again. She said she still believed Susie was alive and would continue to do so until something proved otherwise. When asked about her thoughts about the man who stole her daughter, Marietta said, quote, I guess I feel sorry for him. Anyone who can do a thing like that can't be happy. 
I would like to talk to him to find out why. I guess I'll never get the chance. The topic of the FBI came up, and when Van Swearingen asked Marietta if her phone was tapped, she said that she didn't think it was because a call coming from Montana to Chicago would take hours to trace anyway. As Marietta was saying she didn't think the FBI was listening in, they were in fact listening in as they had tapped Van Swearingen's phone. Despite encouraging him to run the article in the first place, they elected to listen in secretly rather than attempt to work together. The call came just as Mulaney and Tetton had predicted in the early morning hours of June 25, 1974, one year after Susie vanished. The FBI had gotten the Jaeger's phone ready to record and were on standby should anything come up. When Marietta picked up the phone, the caller asked if he was speaking to Susie's mother, to which Marietta replied yes. The caller then said, quote, Well, I'm the guy who took her from you exactly a year ago to the minute. Marietta asked about Susie's whereabouts and if she was alive, to which the caller said yes. To that, Marietta expressed skepticism that Susie was alive, asking how someone like him could take care of a little girl, and the caller responded by saying he was taking better care of her than Marietta could. He said he was traveling the country with her and, quote, We have covered the West pretty well, just sightseeing. Me, I've gotten used to her. At that point, the call cut out, and Marietta thought the caller had hung up, but he promptly called back, saying he'd been disconnected. The FBI was in fact taping the call and attempting a trace, so if Marietta could keep him on the phone for long enough, there was a slim chance they could find out where the call had come from. The caller confirmed the dates and times of his other calls. He also once again confirmed the detail about Susie that had not been shared with the media. She had a deformity with her fingernails where some of them were hooked, which is where the nail sticks up from the finger, almost resembling a dog claw. Marietta was unfazed by all this information. She wanted to hear something new. She said, quote, Tell me something else about her. If you have been with her and traveling around with her, if she really is alive and with you, then you must know a lot of things about her. The caller dodged the question by attempting to taunt Marietta, saying he was working on altering Susie's memories to get her to forget about her family. Marietta would not humor him on his claim, telling him that she had a good home and a good family and she would not forget them. She then tried to get some useful information out of him, prying about how he'd managed to steal Susie without alerting anyone else. He said he'd heard Susie and Heidi talking in the middle of the night, then he waited outside the tent until they fell asleep. The caller redirected the conversation back to his strange tale about reprogramming Susie's memory, and he said he took her because he wanted a daughter of his own. He said they'd been traveling the country together, and he took her to Disneyland. When Marietta directed the conversation back to the night of the abduction, the caller became suspicious and asked if Marietta was recording the conversation, to which she replied that she wasn't. She later remarked that she felt guilty lying, even though this man had likely stolen her daughter. Despite the caller's paranoia, he stayed on the phone with Marietta for over an hour. The two mostly argued about whether or not Susie was really alive. He said he'd only called to give her peace of mind that Susie was living a good life. Marietta told the caller that she was praying for him and wanted to believe him, but she needed proof. She asked the caller what she could do to help him, and he started crying. He said, quote, I wish this burden could be lifted from me. Soon after, the caller wanted to end the call but said he couldn't bring himself to hang up on Marietta, so he asked Marietta to do it for him. Strangely, he asked, quote, Won't you say goodbye to me so that I can say goodbye to you? But Marietta did not say goodbye to him. She simply hung up on the crying man. On the other end of the line, on the other side of the country, David Meerhofer heard the line go silent. David wasn't calling from any kind of traditional phone. He'd driven into a ranch he had worked at, one he knew well enough to drive through in the dark, and he tapped into their line using a mobile telephone handset. He talked to Marietta standing up in his pickup truck, just barely getting close enough to the line to tap in, all while the Green family that owned the land slept in their home nearby. David knew the Green family land well from working on it, but also because it was right next to the old Lockhart Ranch where he'd killed Sandy and burned her body. Just as Mulaney and Tetton had guessed, David had military experience. 
He'd been a switchboard operator in Vietnam, where he learned how to hack into a phone line. But that night he wasn't as careful as he should have been when he snuck out to make the call to Marietta. He had left his tire tracks behind. When July rolled around, the patriarch of the Green family, Ralph, noticed some bizarre charges to his phone bill. When Ralph contacted the phone company about the charges, the girl processing his complaint immediately recognized the name of the recipient, William Yeager in Farmington Hills. When Dunbar questioned Ralph, he was adamant that he was not involved. He even remembered finding strange tire tracks on his land the day in question. Ralph's car had a spare tire with the same track pattern so it stood out to him, and he remembered the model of tire that had likely made the tracks. Conveniently, he even knew someone who had a car with those tires, David Meerhofer. Although it's easy to judge with hindsight in 50 years of advancement in psychology and forensic science, it's important to remember that at the time, profiling was in its infancy and the flaws with polygraphs were not nearly as well understood as they are today. Every clue seemed to point to David, but Dunbar was determined not to let some untested new theories put an innocent man in jail. He'd been in law enforcement for decades and he knew how quickly a town could turn on someone. The town of Manhattan was out for blood and desperate to find someone to blame. This new clue also relied solely on one witness claiming they'd recognized tire tracks that were now washed away. A witness who very well might have had something to hide since the ransom call came from his property. Before the discovery was made that the call came from the Greens' property, the FBI had been attempting to gather any and all usable data the call could provide. Mulaney and Tetton tried to use the call to build their profile further. They were certain the unsub was a sadist and enjoyed tormenting Marietta, but they also discovered that he seemed somewhat afraid of her. Strong women likely intimidated him and she'd managed to catch him off guard numerous times throughout the call. They felt further validated in many of the basic assumptions they'd made, but they felt that getting the most out of the call was above even their skills. They ended up bringing in Dr. Murray Myron, a professor who specialized in psycholinguistics and who'd worked with law enforcement before. Myron was able to guess an astounding number of things right. He guessed the caller was from a rural area but had at least a high school education. He guessed the caller was well off, perhaps even owning several properties. He was certain the caller would crumble when faced with a strong woman and enjoyed preying on those weaker and younger than him. Myron said that if the FBI had a good subject in mind, they should arrange for Marietta to confront him. She alone might be able to get the truth out of him. But he also cautioned that this was a violent, moody, unstable sadist they were dealing with. He craved control, and if he was ever caught, he would almost certainly lash out, either by attacking others or perhaps enacting one final act of control and killing himself. While Mulaney and Tetton felt almost certain that David Meerhofer was the killer, Dunbar needed more evidence. The police presence around David tightened and he was occasionally followed. David noticed that right away and was tolerant and even friendly to the cops, playing up the act that he wanted to do all he could to find the real killer. At one point, he even walked up to the officer who was tailing him and asked if they could carpool to save gas. He got a thrill out of being so close to the investigation. With no other leads coming in, Dunbar eventually had to tell David formally that he was the prime suspect and that he should hire a lawyer. David chose Doug Dassinger to represent him, a lawyer local to nearby Bozeman. Though Dassinger would defend David no matter what, he did genuinely believe he was innocent. He thought David was being singled out because there were no other suspects. Although Dunbar was only finding more evidence to point to David, he still didn't think he did it. David even opened up to him, saying the town had turned against him when he was a kid. He said he'd been in a fight when he was younger where a knife had fallen out of his pocket, and even though he was the one who got stabbed with it, the town decided he was a monster for having the knife in the first place. He'd even had to attend counseling about the whole thing. David went so far as to give Dunbar written permission to speak to the psychiatrist he'd spoken to in his youth. Though David had only attended a few sessions, the psychiatrist had a lot to say. He told Dunbar a slightly different version of events about the fight that had turned the town against David. Apparently, David had befriended a 14-year-old middle school boy when he was 17, and the two had become so close that the child's parents were worried the boys were romantically involved. 
When another boy became close to the boy David was friends with, David decided to teach him a lesson. When recounting the story, David insisted to the psychiatrist that he was not gay and was not jealous of this other boy. He simply thought he was a bad influence on his friend. David ended up driving the boy out to the middle of the woods, where they both got out of the car and proceeded to fight. David said the knife came out of his pocket by accident, but once it was out, the boys fought over it and David ended up getting stabbed. At that point, the fight diffused and the boys drove back to town to take David to the hospital. The incident was disturbing enough to the psychiatrist that when Michael Rainey was stabbed in 1968, he told authorities that they should look into David. David was questioned and cleared, and after seeing him grow up into a well-adjusted man, the doctor changed his mind. He told Dunbar that he no longer believed David was capable of murder and did not stand by his earlier accusation. As far as the psychiatrist was concerned, David had a relatively normal home life, though when his parents divorced, it hit David hard. He did think that David might have had homosexual tendencies, but wouldn't admit it, and that David very clearly had issues with women. Despite all of these issues, the doctor told Dunbar emphatically that he did not believe David was capable of murder and that he thought Dunbar had the wrong man. Desperate for some kind of way to move the investigation forward, Dunbar asked David to submit to a truth serum test using sodium amytal. The test took place on August 19th, and just like the polygraph, David was hesitant but eventually agreed to help clear his name. Just like with the polygraph, he passed with flying colors. Though he would never admit guilt, that night a strange attack happened at a nearby Girl Scout camp that was almost certainly David's work. The truth serum test had been administered at the hospital over an hour away from Manhattan, so David had had to travel out of town for it. That night, at a Girl Scout camp just 27 miles from the hospital, two girls were attacked. They were walking around camp together after dark when a man in a mask emerged from the woods. He threw one girl down and wrapped a rope around her neck, but another girl nearby heard the girl screaming and shined a flashlight over. The flashlight spooked the man and he retreated into the woods. Apparently, the camp counselors thought the girls might have made the whole thing up, but called the police anyway to report the incident, on the off chance the girls were telling the truth. The dismissive nature of the person who called in the incident, coupled with the fact that it was so far from Manhattan, meant it didn't get to Dunbar right away. And when the tip did arrive, it was mixed in with all the other endless calls from psychics and local townspeople vaguely speculating that they had a bad feeling about David. That same night, Dunbar had called Mulaney and Tetton. They had the old argument that profiling was a new science and that Tetton and Mullaney had never actually spoken to David or been to the location where the crimes had taken place. They were speculating at their desks on the other side of the country and they desperately needed to be proven right because their work was still being viewed as pseudoscience. Dunbar even hung up on them that night after the conversation was just going in circles. The next day, David consented to let the police search his home and workshop. David likely hid the most damning evidence against him, but neglected a few things. In his record book, he had a receipt from a truck stop in Cheyenne, Wyoming from September 24, 1973, the day one of the calls was made to the Jaeger family. David had also written instructions in his calendar on how to get to the Girl Scout camp where the strange attack happened the same day he was out of town. However, Dunbar hadn't yet heard the report of what happened there, so he didn't immediately connect the dots. They also found blood-stained sheets and numerous items that looked to have been taken from a woman or a child. A little girl's blouse, a tube of lipstick, and a silver heart necklace. There was also an extensive collection of newspaper clippings, one of which was just a clipping of a picture of a little girl from Butte named Karen Smith. Nothing unfortunate had befallen her yet, but David had saved her picture from the paper for some reason. Perhaps the most strange of all were two tickets to Disneyland for one adult and one child. Though Susie's parents and much of the law enforcement involved were convinced Susie was dead, they had no concrete proof yet, and Dunbar was still hoping there was a small chance they could find her alive. David had excuses for everything, saying many of the suspicious items were already in his workshop when he bought it, and that the Disneyland tickets were a gift he never ended up using. 
Although they didn't find anything that would justify an arrest, the disturbing items on David's property were enough to finally turn Dunbar against him. He started to believe that David might actually be guilty. Police launched another search of the Lockhart property, hoping to find something concrete to link the older skeleton to Susie Yeager, and determine once and for all if the ranch was where she'd met her end. They'd managed to piece together most of Sandy's skull by then, and hadn't found any identifying bones for the child's skeleton. Police dug up much of the property, hoping to find something buried, and they found an intact sacrum bone, a connective bone between the pelvis and spine. This bone hadn't been smashed, instead it was hacked away intact and buried, but any kind of jawbone or skull fragment from the second skeleton still evaded them. As summer drew to a close, Dunbar and the rest of law enforcement came up with the idea to do a voice lineup of David and a few other suspects. David didn't fight them on that at all. On the surface, he was just exasperated and ready to prove his innocence. They brought in a few of David's family members and a local man that David thought had a similar voice to him, and one by one had each man read off the first lines of the anniversary call. Marietta and Bill sat in separate rooms so they wouldn't influence each other's reactions. They both picked David as a clear match. Three days later, Dunbar informed David that he was the prime suspect in the murder and to discourage him from lashing out, he told him he was being watched by law enforcement around the clock. David went about his business as usual and was friendly with the police tailing him. He ran errands and chatted with locals, even attending a church potluck, bringing a venison casserole. Back in Quantico, Mulaney started making plans to try out Myron's idea of making David have a discussion with Marietta. Mulaney, Dunbar, and Tetton talked the plan through with the higher-ups and were surprised to see that they would allow for the unusual plan to move forward. David and his lawyer Doug Dassinger readily agreed as well. All parties agreed that the meeting would take place in Dassinger's office and the FBI would be allowed to listen in. On September 18th, Marietta and Bill flew out to Bozeman. Part of David's condition was that the meeting needed to be held in secret, so the Jaegers stayed with Dunbar in his house in Bozeman. That night, Dunbar spoke with Marietta about how the meeting would go and described David in detail so she would have an idea of what to expect and not feel thrown off when she first met him. The next day, Marietta went into the meeting hopeful she could get David to trust her. As a deeply religious woman, she trusted in God to protect her. She had also been praying to God to help her forgive David and approach him with compassion. When David sat down, Marietta calmly asked him where Susie was. She told him matter-of-factly that she knew he'd taken her and she just wanted answers. David responded just as cordially that he would never do such a thing and he wanted the case solved as much as anyone else. This went on for over an hour and neither Marietta or David betrayed any serious emotion. Though the subject matter was grim, the discussion was civil and calm. Eventually, Dassinger put a stop to the meeting and Marietta and David even shook hands at the end. David ended by saying, quote, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Yeager. I wish I could help you, but I don't know anything about your little girl. I hope you find her. Bill asked Marietta in private if she wanted him to go after David, but she told him not to. Despite the conversation going nowhere, Dunbar was convinced they were close to getting what they needed. He thought if there was a way they could have David and Marietta talk somewhere they could be alone without lawyers and police listening in, she might be able to get him to crack. That night, Marietta called David's home phone and the two talked again. They went in circles for about 45 minutes before Marietta felt she was getting nowhere, though David did get more emotional this time around. Marietta felt like she was close to getting him to admit something if she could only see him face to face again. As they were saying goodbye, Marietta asked David if he would talk to her one more time in person and he invited her to come to his workshop the next day. Though the two had agreed to meet without anyone else present, local police sent plainclothes officers to hang around near David's workshop and even put a sniper on a nearby building. Manhattan being the small town it was, the sniper was Ron Skinner, one of David's old acquaintances from high school and the man who'd helped find Sandy's car. Skinner later remarked that he wasn't sure if he would have been able to shoot David if he had to. 
When Marietta showed up at David's workshop, she stayed on the stoop. He didn't try to get her to come inside, and he didn't step outside. Marietta kept the conversation brief. This time, she focused on the evidence found in David's house, asking if he had stolen Susie to replace whatever girl he had taken to Disneyland. This notably threw him off, and he said nothing. She also took the opportunity to say that she had forgiven him, and that God could forgive him too if he would only just admit what he had done. She told him that she only wanted to help, and that if he would confess, he could get the help he needed, to which he replied, quote, I don't need any help. Nothing's wrong with me. I'm not sick. Eventually, Marietta felt she'd covered all the basis, and once again shook his hand before departing. Days later, on September 24th, the Jaegers were back home in Michigan. David called them just after noon, using the alias Mr. Travis. When he introduced himself and said his fake name, Marietta responded with, quote, Yes, hello, David. To which David stuttered out, quote, David who? What are you talking about? Which derailed the conversation into Marietta insisting they'd met, and David acting flustered that he had no idea what she was talking about. He did not attempt to disguise his voice. Eventually, Marietta agreed to stop calling him David as he was becoming irate and she wanted to see if she could get anything useful out of him. He kept up the ruse that Susie was alive and talked vaguely of finally trying to make a ransom exchange work. Marietta told him she didn't believe he really had Susie, and said that if he did, she would be allowed to talk to her, to which David refused. The two discussed whether it would be possible to arrange a ransom exchange without the FBI present, and Marietta insisted that she didn't believe David had Susie. By this point, Marietta didn't think there was any way David had kept Susie hidden all this time. Eventually, David stopped speaking and Marietta heard a door open, and to her shock, Marietta heard a little girl start speaking into the phone. She said simply, quote, This guy, he's nice, and I'm sitting on his lap. Then shuffling around was heard and the girl was gone. Marietta knew Susie's voice, and this girl was not her. But it had been a year, perhaps Susie's voice had changed. And even if it wasn't Susie, did David have his next victim in the room with him as he taunted Marietta? The slim possibility that Susie might have been kept alive all this time, even if Marietta didn't really believe it, had her rattled, but she didn't show it. She immediately told David that she knew Susie's voice and this girl was not her. The conversation went in circles as Marietta tried to get David to give back whatever girl he had in his possession. When she said, quote, Please, David, please let her come home. David became irate that she was calling him David again. Finally, he simply said, quote, You're never going to get Susie back, and hung up. The minute Marietta picked up the phone, she'd signaled to her family to call the police and have authorities confront David back in Montana. But despite round-the-clock surveillance, David had managed to sneak out of his house. They couldn't find him anywhere in Manhattan. He'd gone home around 4 p.m. the previous day and hadn't been seen since. So if he had escaped soon after being spotted, he could be almost anywhere in the western half of the United States. His car was in the shop, but that didn't mean much. He could have stolen or borrowed one. Police had all phone operators on the western switchboards trying to track down the call that had gone to the Jaeger family home. In just two hours, they'd traced it to a motel in Utah called the Salt Place Travel Lodge. By the time police arrived at the motel, David was gone, and no one at the motel recalled seeing him. So it's possible he hacked into the phone lines or used the lobby phone when no one was looking. David reappeared in town the next day, and when questioned by police, he said he'd been so busy working that he wasn't answering the door. He also said he'd been going around town running errands. They just must have been missing each other. On September 27th, law enforcement made the decision to arrest David. He was a potential danger to himself and others, and though they would have liked to have more evidence, they needed to move forward with what they had. Don Houghton and Ron Skinner were both present at the arrest. When they booked David, however, he had a rather incriminating piece of evidence still on him. He was a piece of stationery from the Salt Place Travel Lodge with the alias Mr. Travis scrawled on it. Apparently, he'd been worried that he would forget his fake name when he called and felt the need to write it down. 
With David in jail, police were free to search his property more aggressively. They found the telephone device that could be used to hook up a phone at any point in a line. They found a mask David had made out of a woman's blouse, but the most damning evidence of all was in David's freezer. He had the usual deer and elk meat from his hunts, but he also had some packages that were marked with the initials SMDS. Another package was unmarked, but when detectives opened it, they found a severed human hand that had been wrapped around two additional severed fingers. Police brought Dassinger onto the scene, and he was ready to criticize them for trashing his client's house. But when they showed him the severed hand, he simply replied with, Oh fuck, and then went to throw up outside. Forensic analysis of the meat in David's fridge showed that the ones he'd labeled deer meat were actually human flesh mixed with cow fat. He'd also made jerky out of the human meat. The fingerprints from the severed hand came back as belonging to Sandy, and police concluded that SMDS was likely Sandy's initials as her full name was Sandra Mae Dykeman Smalligan. That discovery brought about the disturbing revelation that David was likely not always bringing deer meat to all of the potlucks he had attended over the years. It's impossible to prove conclusively, but the cow fat he'd added to the human flesh was what hunters usually added to game meat to make it taste better. When Dassinger made his way to David's cell that night, he couldn't help but lose his composure. He genuinely believed David was innocent until he'd seen one of his victims chopped up. He yelled at him and told him that he didn't know if there was anything he could do to save him from the death penalty, but David had his own ideas. He asked his lawyer if he could be spared the death penalty if he was willing to confess to his other murders. He said he would confess to two other murders that he hadn't been charged with, and that night told Dassinger the grisly details. The next morning, Dassinger met with County Attorney Tom Olson. David was willing to plead guilty and confess to everything, as long as he would be spared the death penalty and the recording of his confession would never be made public. He did not want his family to hear what he had done. In the early morning hours of the 29th, Dassinger, Dunbar, and Olson were ready to sit down for the confession. They'd been drafting the paperwork all day, and though it was nearly 3 a.m., they had not slept. During the confession, David revealed some useful details, but also evaded questions and said things that did not line up with the evidence found. He told the police that they could find Susie's severed head thrown in the outhouse on the property, ending once and for all the speculation that she might have been alive. David claimed he had killed Susie after he undressed her, but that he did not do anything sexual with her before he killed her, as she was fighting back. David formally confessed to murdering Sandy and said that she'd suffocated in the trunk of his car, so he'd killed her by accident. Neither of these stories accounts for the bloody whip and knotted rope found at the ranch or the fact that the closet within the house had been nailed shut and had human waste in it. David confessed to the murder of Michael Rainey as well, but wouldn't admit he'd hit him over the head. David did not say why he killed Michael, but it's possible it was for personal reasons. That year, David had been an assistant to the Scoutmaster. That was when he was in high school, and apparently, David would befriend many of the very young campers, which unsettled some of the parents of the boys. David was even kicked out of the program because of what was reported vaguely as concerning behavior. Michael Rainey was killed just two days after David was removed from the program. David also confessed to the murder of a 13-year-old boy named Bernard Pullman, who died on March 19th of 1967. David had been driving around when he spotted Bernard playing with a friend on a bridge in the woods. David got out of his truck to watch the boys, and when Bernard climbed up on a pole on the bridge, David shot him in the chest. Bernard had fallen into the river, and it took almost a month to find his body when it washed into a wire net five miles downriver. Though his death was strange, there was speculation on if he'd perhaps been killed on accident by a stray bullet, as people hunted nearby. His death would occasionally show up in papers as a local mystery, sometimes even alongside the story of Michael Rainey, and now police had answers for both murders. David said he'd recognized Bernard from around town, but did not provide any motive for why he killed him. 
David was only 25 at the time of this confession, so he would have still been in high school for both of those murders. Dunbar went through several unsolved murders, kidnappings, and assaults that happened in Montana or nearby states and questioned David on his involvement in them. David would insist he had not killed anyone else, and he also insisted that he had not been the one to attack the Girl Scouts on the day he was out of town. Conveniently, all four murders that David confessed to were in the same county, which upped his chances of getting a lighter sentence. Also, Dunbar was going off of his memory alone concerning the other murders and got a few of the names wrong. As Olson, Dassinger, and Dunbar departed that morning, Dunbar told Sheriff Andy Anderson, quote, Andy, if you've ever watched a prisoner in your life, watch this one. They emphasized that he was a possible suicide risk. When the deputy sheriff who had been on duty during the ordeal was preparing to swap with his relief, one of Anderson's sergeants told him not to tell his replacement anything. The man coming in was apparently a known gossip, and they didn't want word of the confession spreading. David was left alone most of the night because officers were not allowed in the cell block if they were alone in the building. But around 8.30, the guard went in to check on David. He asked him how he was doing, and David responded, quote, Not so good. The next jailer after that came on duty at around 9.30, but didn't get time to check the cell block until an hour later. Sometime that morning, between 8.30 a.m. and 10.25 a.m., David Meerhofer hung himself with his bath towel. By the time police found him, there was no chance of resuscitation. When word spread that David had killed himself, Sandy's father went to find the local pastor. Sandy's dad was good friends with Clifford Meerhofer, and he wanted the pastor to go with him to comfort Clifford, as now they'd both lost a child. Only David's mother and a select few other family members attended his funeral. He was buried outside of town. Manhattan was finally done with him. The search for Susie's remains began that day, and the police on the scene drew straws to see who had wade through the outhouse muck. Don Houghton was the unlucky winner. He'd been first on the scene for her disappearance, and now, over a year later, he found her skull wrapped in newspaper decomposing in the muck. On October 4th, an inquest was held to determine if law enforcement would be held responsible for David's death. All nine members of the jury involved agreed that Sheriff Anderson was responsible for David's death, but not criminally responsible as the death was caused by negligence. This meant that the sheriff would not do any jail time or be fined, but his career in law enforcement was effectively over. Marietta never expressed any happiness over David being dead. Even in those tense last days when she'd been talking face-to-face -face with David, she told law enforcement that she did not want to push for the death penalty, as it's not what Susie would have wanted. Before she left town, Marietta went to the cell David killed himself in to pray for his soul. On October 15th, a second funeral was held for Sandy. By that time, over 1,800 bone fragments of hers had been collected and were finally returned to the family. They buried the bones in a child-sized coffin. Over 30 years later, Sandy's wallet and one of her notebooks would be found in the wall of David's workshop when it was being renovated, and law enforcement returned those items to her family as well. Susie's parents finally had a death certificate and were able to properly lay her to rest, though they'd accepted her death long before. In the years that followed, Marietta would periodically travel the country, speaking at churches and rallies about the power of forgiveness. She told the Billings Gazette that, quote, Susie had been chosen by God. He had allowed her to be a little sacrificial lamb to give her life so other children could live and grow up without the threat of death and evil. Marietta and David's mother still exchange Christmas cards and speak when Marietta travels to Montana. Eventually, Marietta became active in politics and started campaigning against the death penalty, though she always cautioned that she believed some people did need to spend a life in prison to keep the rest of society safe. After David killed himself, the FBI ordered the coroner to examine his brain and try to see if any abnormalities might have helped explain what was wrong with him. They didn't find anything conclusive. Perhaps the single tragic aspect of David killing himself was that the true extent of his crimes may never be known. There were other murdered children and other slain women, but none of that could be linked conclusively back to him. 
The little girl's voice heard over the phone was never linked to a crime, though the audio quality and a click heard just before she spoke gave police hope that the voice was simply a recording. If David did have additional victims, they might not ever all be traceable, as there were likely some overseas. David was in the Marines from October 1st, 1968 to August 26th of 1971, which meant he had already killed two people by the time he had joined. Accounts given later of David's behavior in the service seemed on the surface to show a clean-cut, responsible man. He had no interest in frequenting brothels with his fellow Marines. Instead, he preferred to spend time alone. For a while, he was stationed near an orphanage and he loved to spend time helping the nuns with the children. He could have had any number of victims while he was there. The chilling manner in which David planned out his later murders, killing and kidnapping when witnesses were just feet away, made him uniquely terrifying. Though there were many unsolved murders in Montana, there were not many that involved the same level of planning and stealth. However, in 1987, David's brother Alan was arrested in connection with a string of child rapes in Washington State, and his crimes bore a striking resemblance to David's. Alan would stalk his victims beforehand and sneak into their houses in the middle of the night. He cut the phone line so no one could call for help, then take children from their houses away in his car to assault them in a private place. When he let his victims go, he told them not to identify him or he would burn their house down and kill their families. The string of rapes that happened around when Alan was at large were never all conclusively linked back to him, so he was not given a life sentence. In 2017, Allen was released from prison and remains a free man to this day. Interestingly, when Allen and David's father Clifford passed in 2009, he had David's name stricken from his obituary, but not Allen's despite the fact that Allen was already in jail. When dealing with serial killers and sexual predators, police often look for a history of childhood abuse. But that's never been proven to be the case with the Mirhofer family, though it is disturbing that two of the children grew up to be so violent. By all accounts, Clifford Mirhofer was not abusive, but there were a few things about the Mirhofer family that were a bit strange. Clifford had a proclivity for young girls, and when he and Eleanor divorced, he married his 18-year-old secretary. Clifford had numerous affairs over the years, and one of his partners even lived at the Lockhart Ranch before it was abandoned. It's also strange that Clifford suspected his son of murder right away when Sandy vanished. It seems that he knew something was off about his son. He also may not have been the only member of the family to suspect something. Days before he was caught, David's teenage sister turned in a creative writing assignment to her English teacher that involved a murderer hiding body parts in a freezer and stealing jewelry from his victims. But law enforcement didn't follow up with her until years later, and by then she'd claimed she didn't remember why she wrote the story, though she did say that David would help her with her homework. It's possible she asked for ideas for a story, and he gave her a thinly veiled account of his own crimes dressed up as a story. He did enjoy the thrill of almost being caught. The whole thing is very odd. Many questions still linger about David Mirhofer. He was a man who butchered a little girl and kept part of her pelvis as a trophy, but also cried to her mother over the phone about the guilt he carried around. He quite possibly fed his neighbors and family bits of his victims, but he didn't want his family to read the grisly transcript of his confession. Though police could not gain the answers they'd hoped for from David, his case did pave the way for new advancements in psychological profiling and an overhauling of the polygraph system. Patrick Mullaney and Howard Tetton would go on to further refine their methods after the first success. The Behavioral Science Unit took off the next few years, and Robert Ressler would go on to make a name for himself when he started working with John Douglas and Ann Burgess to continue Tetton and Mullaney's work. They traveled the country interviewing serial killers and attempting to put together a more concrete idea of how to catch them. John Douglas would eventually write the book Mindhunter, which brought the practice of FBI profiling into the pop culture zeitgeist. Though the true extent of David Mirhofer's crimes may never be known, the methods used to catch him have no doubt helped to keep countless other families from experiencing the same grief caused by a similar monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE.
That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.